Go ahead. <clears throat> Hello. Hello and welcome to a Critical Dragon, where I will get through my intro and we will talk about archetypes and dragons. And this this is number fifteen in the series. I hate you, Philip. I hate <laughs> you with a passion. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> Go ahead. <clears throat> there may, just in case you're wondering, there may have been a discussion before we started recording about what number this was, and Philip was making fun of me again. So, what? we we are going to discuss dragons today. Yes, um, and critical dragon discussing dragons. How about that? <laughs> oh, this is going to be a long video, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, right. For those of you still watching, <laughs> welcome to A Critical Dragon, where we talk about narrative and film, television, and books. And today we're talking about archetypes and dragons. Hello, Philip. How are you? I'm <laughs> uh, just uh, happy to be here, AP. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? We, I'm we, leaving we... all of this in. Oh, no. <laughs> but we want to talk about dragons. But before we get started on this, um, yeah. A, a, an important sort of distinction to be made here. Yes, I can't discuss Eastern dragons or Mesoamerican dragons or feathered serpents or a lot of the stuff from a, a, the different cultures around the world because I haven't studied them. I'm not an expert on them. I haven't done research on them. I, I haven't written about them. I, I know the vaguest tiny elements about them. And basically that boils down to I know they are different traditions. I know they have very different things about them. It is something that I intend in the future to actually look into to find out more about. I'm interested in it, but mm. for the the purpose of this, I can't talk about them because I don't know. And it, it's important to be upfront. I'm not going to try and bluff my way through this. I don't know about them. What I studied was Western fantasy and the dragon in Western fantasy is obviously a a very powerful, almost ubiquitous trope and, and archetype of fantasy. And I think it has a fascinating tradition. That's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. But I want to point out from the very beginning, this is not the only fantasy dragon type. This is not the only tradition in which dragons occur. And there are very rich, important, fascinating traditions. I'm just not aware of them, so I can't talk about them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and with one possible exception, and, and it's not the same as dragons that you might have in traditions coming from, say, China or other places, but uh, the Meso ancient Mesopotamian uh, goddess Tiamat, uh, who is the, the, the primordial, uh, she's a personification or a dragonification, I guess, of uh, the primordial sea from which all creation comes. And that is an interesting I think thing because in a lot of mythological traditions, interesting because we always associate dragons with fire, but dragons are often uh, seen in the context of water as well. And water being a uh, mythologically associated with life, but also with death. And Tiamat is just that. She is the, the source of, of life, but she is also a source of death such that she wants to eat the gods and finally Marduk, uh, has to defeat her and he's the hero and they make it, it's a really wonderful mythological tradition but the idea of associating dragons with water and also there are associations of life and death um along with that i, I go way 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 back and i think these are things that are carried through in Western tradition in many respects. Um, so there's a long, obviously we're not gonna go to, this is not a history of dragons, but there, there are some really interesting mythological resonances here. And in terms of what dragons, why do dragons exist? What are they for? As Tolkien famously said, I desire dragons, right? And, and they're such a staple of fantasy, so. Dragons to exist to, to prove that we can kill them. Uh -huh. to, yeah. to paraphrase another author. Yeah. Um, but uh, dragons are fascinating because, like, generally speaking, like when when we think about Western dragons, you have wyverns and dragons and all sorts of draco forms. Uh, yeah. the, the form they take can be quite varied from a a uh, six petal, so uh, two 
the two wings and then front legs and back legs. So it has six right. limbs or yeah, yeah. it has wings and back limbs. So it has only four limbs and you yeah. go, right. So think about that way. And they go, oh yeah, but the four limb one is much more realistic. <laughs> did, yeah. did you just say the four limbed dragon is more realistic than the six limbed mythical dragon that can breathe mm. fire okay so i'm not getting into a semantic argument about what different authors or different traditions call dragons but right. what they symbolize is actually fascinating yeah and how they get used in fantasy is again they get used in a lot of different ways because we have them ranging from dumb sort of beasts that need to be slain they can right. be sentient beasts that need to be slain. They can be well-armored flying horses, or they can be characters in and of their own right. They can be integrated into the world, or they can just seem to be, oh yeah, there just happens to be dragons because it's a fantasy world. Awesome, let's move on, you know? Right, and right. there's a lot of different things at play. So I thought we'd start, they are very important, obviously, to Norse mythology. Yes, yes, and indeed. You being much more of an expert on this, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, yeah. Let's uh, talk about Norse dragons a bit and then perhaps bring in Beowulf as well um, because they're somewhat related, I would say. Um, but Sorry, I was uh, going to laugh and say, oh, really? You're going to talk about Beowulf, are you? <laughs> Beowulf comes up, you know? It's an important text for... Uh, it comes uh, up every time, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> because it's cool it's because cool we, people are. to be perfectly honest but we can we go oh did you see that local sports game oh yes so in beowulf when they were doing <laughs> you know i was just trying to fix my uh, dvd drive on my computer well in beowulf when they were trying to fix <laughs> to be fair though there is a dragon in beowulf yes. um, which we can talk about actually why don't we talk about beowulf first since i have been <clears throat> unfairly picked upon. Uh, so the dragon in Beowulf is uh, a bit different from the Grendel and his mother part of the story because for that we, we know that uh, the, the part of the story with Grendel and his mother goes way, way, way back. And that was something that uh, we, we know because there are similar stories in Old Norse uh, of this hero going out and fighting the troll and having to fight the troll's mother and, and saving the locals, that sort of thing. You have the Greater Saga, for example, um, one of the Icelandic sagas that uh, you, you'd recognize right away that, oh, that's basically the same story as, Great, as Beowulf, that part of that saga. So, and there are a couple other versions of the story. So it's one that goes way back, but the Christian poet who put together Beowulf added the dragon to the whole narrative. And it's interesting because by that point, the, the Anglo-Saxons were Christianized. And so there might be some associations taken from the Bible because uh, dragons are referred to in the Bible as well. Um, but the, the beast that we meet in Beowulf, is, is, it's fascinating because again, it is it lives by the water. Uh, there is a water association. And when Beowulf and Wiglof, uh, mainly Wiglof actually, uh, kills the dragon, uh, they dump its body in the water and it returns to the water. And there's this sense even from the beginning of the poem that the, the water is a symbol of the, the great unknown. You know, it is a, a kind of life and death sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting, but the, the dragon also sits on a treasure that it has taken over from a people and this people is gone. They were wiped out, not by the dragon, by the way. The, there was a last survivor. These people had been wiped out by war and disease. And there was the famous part of the poem called The Lay of the Last Survivor, where he buries the, the treasure of his people and laments their, their demise. And then he goes off and dies somewhere. And later this dragon comes and sits on this treasure. Um, and treasure being, from the Christian poet's point of view, a symbol of futility, ultimately. Um, but all, it, it's not so much greed, but the, the, the but there is the a greed element. The the Go obsession ahead. with material goods instead of the spiritual goods, because exactly the, the Christian elements of the interpretation of Beowulf, I th I think, are incredibly important and so often yeah. kind of overlooked because we see the connections to 
the earlier sagas and we go oh it, it's coming from that tradition you go yeah but it was written by christian monks mm -hmm. and they yeah. stole as all good authors do they stole from someone else and did their version of it yeah precisely so and and beowulf is actually in terms of age beowulf is the older story uh yes the anglo-saxons have been christianized and so that was an, a, a stronger influence on on their poetic tradition if you will whereas people off in iceland who wrote the, the vast majority of the sagas and stuff uh were christianized later around the year 1000 um so and they seem to be more capable of preserving the older traditions without because most of what we know about germanic myth comes from iceland really um and they, so they were they were not as at, at pains for whatever reasons to remove any mention of odin and thor and all of this so we seem to have a a stronger uh tradition from from there uh, in terms of germanic myth so but those stories are are more recent because those sagas and stories were written down in you know 13th century thereabouts so um whereas the beowulf manuscript is from the year about the year 1000 but the story was probably composed uh there's a lot of debate about this but it, it i think it was probably in the eighth century that it was composed um so it's quite a bit older actually um so anyway the norse dragons we get continue this element of greed so we have fafnir for example who it was a dwarf who sat on a treasure and turned into a dragon um, and he is a, a patricidal dwarf uh <laughs> and it, it might be the greed that turns him into a dragon but there's also the patricide that happens as well um so uh and he um yeah he becomes a dragon uh for sigurd to eventually slay um so uh and it, it lots of familiar i think fantasy tropes can be recognized in these old stories there's the greed there's the treasure the cursed treasure by the way because this treasure that fafnir sits on ends up being the demise of sigurd because it's cursed um and uh so and there is a ring also associated with it in some versions of the story so you see where this is kind of going right but remember one of the last things that we talked about was the monstrous other this idea of creating a physicality a monstrous physicality around a negative aspect and so right. you can see how attractive this is say for someone like tolkien going i need a personification a physical manifestation of greed and evil and the yeah. dragon fits that because of uh, the the christian illusions because yeah. of the link between the dragon and hell and satan and sin and all of these things that mm -hmm. this is the worst aspect of humanity where the best aspect is angelic and spiritual and toward heaven the evil aspect is made physically manifest in a powerful physical but demonic form and that the big bat like wings that have those they often depicted as basically a bat hand with the the um, leathery skin between them the way a bat's wings work um right. but with scales because it's drawing in images of the worm or the serpent um yeah. so the scaling because it's reptilian and not mammalian um the fangs in the mouth because it is a predator and it is dangerous and it's yeah. about murder and mayhem breathing fire the infernal flames of hell fire and brimstone that sure. you can see suddenly all of these elements they are about evoking evil and very much and a lot of it associated with aspects of that lens and we can talk about um the finding of fossils and how people may have found these mm. strange fossils and go well, what the hell is that thing or seen yeah. lizards and said oh that that must be like a baby dragon the the old myth about salamanders being born in the flame and it was because when they threw the log on that the salamander was quite happy sleeping in and suddenly right. its home is on fire so it would scuttle out of the fire and they go, oh look a salamander was born in the fire you're like well that's one way of looking at it yeah yeah but the the impressive nature of dragons as a foe saint george and the dragon mm -hmm. the, the yeah. saintly knight defeating the evil monster and so right. we can always the dragon quite often was set up as this powerful monstrous foe 
to be defeated by the good heart, by the yeah. true knight, by good yeah. Christian virtues and believing in God and Dieu est mon droit, um, things like that. And I, I, yeah. that plays into a, a lot of the imagery about dragons. Right, but right. then when you get to modern fantasy, it's like, well, what can we do with it? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it is a massive playground. And this, this is the, the part of this stuff that I love. Yeah, exactly. And to take one of the, the most well-known, look at Tolkien, what he does with Smaug in The Hobbit. And he combines, I mentioned Fafnir, and Fafnir is among many Norse dragons. There are quite a few great examples in there, but um, Tolkien seems to have combined the Beowulf dragon with the Norse Fafnir in giving us this character Smaug and the idea that dragons can talk and not only can they talk, but they can seduce you. They have a kind of dragon uh, magic about them that if you're not careful, you know, they will with their you know, put you in a trance, you know, that sort of thing. So that's the idea also that you don't give a dragon your name. That's that's straight out of Old Norse when Sigurd uh, slays Fafnir. Fafnir wants to know his name so we can curse him, right? So Tolkien picks up on that. That's why Bilbo calls himself barrel rider and all these other things because you don't tell a dragon your real name that gets you in big trouble right but, I guess so. it, but before we 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 go oh yes because the norse invented this naming is so powerful oh, yeah. in all of um, uh, odysseus uh, in the the cave of the cyclops yeah. what yeah. is your name no one oh who's attacking you no one well why are you <laughs> shouting then <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's great. Yeah, no, the idea of the power of naming and that goes into, we should do a whole video on that, really, because there's all kinds of great fantasy magic systems with that as its basis. Uh, so, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, Tolkien had a great time, uh, you know, writing Smaug, you can tell, um, and, and drawing from lots of nods, because the whole stealing of the cup, obviously. Um, with that Bilbo steals is right from Beowulf, where what pisses off the dragon in the first place, somebody steals a cup from its hoard and it goes out and it destroys. So, yeah. but also for Tolkien, then why steal a cup? You go, oh no, it's it, it's in Beowulf, and you go, really? The cup, like a chalice, one one could almost call it a grail. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and mean, there you go. With lots more mythological resonance there for sure. Yeah. Um. So it, you, you can see for Tolkien, like he used dragons very much in that evil sort of vein. And mm -hmm. in uh, Margaret Weiss and, and Tracy Hickman's Dragonlance Chronicles, you had yeah. evil dragons, but you also had good dragons. Um, and they they played with it and they were sentient. They were fully sentient. Uh, they were people. They had personalities. Um, they had they were immensely powerful and had different types of magical breath because oh well if i have a bronze dragon it's going to have this and a silver dragon is going to do that and a green dragon is good and suddenly it was let's play around with this because D, &D had a lot of fun with dragons because they they stole tiamat uh, yes and, of course yeah. And, yeah and put her in D, D. but um there was a, a book series when i was a kid called uh, it was, it was by a guy called i think richard a knack k-n-a-a-k i think and okay. in it there were all of the each of the books basically had these different dragons, the dragon lords uh, that ruled the land, and the humans were their servants. But you had wow. sea dragons and acid dragons and lava dragons. You know, all of these different colors and types of dragons and where they lived changed their personality and their breath weapon. And you could see the versatility of it, and why some of them were very aggressive, and then other ones were actually, you know, I'm much more sensible. I'm some were very warlike they turned them into people hmm. um, and it, it was a lot of fun as a kid it was an immense amount of fun to read those uh but Anne mccaffrey's dragon riders of of pern, of pern which, yeah you know yeah. may on the first glance look a little bit like fantasy and obviously changes into science fiction very quickly yeah interesting yeah but the, <laughs> the i mean the idea is that it's another it's another planet and then these it's, uh, it's been a while since I've read Dragon Riders of Pern, but um, 
there's a whole backstory that she she goes back and writes about the the colonizing of this planet and and initially the little dragons they're little aren't they and then they get bigger i can't remember everything but yeah but there, are, there are little ones i think yeah but one of the interesting things about that is it's one of the functions of dragons in in fantasy because we talked about the dragon as the enemy as the manifestation quite often of all of the negative aspects in a very right. physically powerful form but right. one of the other things is they are fancy horses that can fly through the air. That that's yeah. they get used essentially as the eagles in the Lord of the Rings or an Uber. They are fantasy Uber. And, dragon rider, yeah, yeah. And you know, this this is really, really curious because these immensely powerful creatures, you go, how how did humans end up taming them to go, yes, we're just gonna ride around on their backs? You go, the humans are snacks to these things. Yeah. And one of one of the modern series that I love for this was Naomi Novik's. I think the the first one is uh, His Majesty's Dragon. I can't, yes. it, but it's Naomi Novik, and it's the the Tremor Rare. I, I always mispronounce it series, and she incorporates dragons into the Napoleonic Wars. Ah, that they exist on Earth as real, uh, so it is our basically it's our world but with dragons in the Napoleonic era. And yeah. one of the things that I absolutely loved about Novik's series is she considered the logistics of a dragon. If the dragon is the size mm -hmm. of a house, it needs to eat a lot. And this yeah. is why you couldn't have hundreds of dragons at your disposal, because how were you going to feed them? If they have to <laughs> eat two cows a day, that's 600 over 600 700 cows a year for wow. one dragon how much wow. land do you need to raise enough cattle to feed all of the dragons and where's the beef wow yeah and so because she brings that in it explains why there aren't thousands of dragons it explains yeah. why they they are incredibly useful but they're also incredibly precious and she adds in, you know, like the telepathic communication that we got in Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders, uh, the bond between the rider and the dragon, the personality that each dragon has as, as a character. All of these different elements got woven together in Novik series. And really, I love those first books. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting how we get this ambiguity about dragons because they are creatures that could gobble us up for a snack but they also are companions sometimes and in these are, there are tons of examples of this and and as you, a, a lot of the the fantasy written for younger readers um such as the inheritance cycle the aragon books uh they appear in harry potter uh to some degree uh, although they're not quite the companions that you have in, in the inheritance cycle. But a couple of the authors that I think really do some interesting things with them would be Robin Hobb in the realm of the elderlings and also Ursula Le Guin in Earthsea because of the relationship between dragons and humans there. Uh, both, both authors actually do some brilliant stuff in terms of the relationship between dragons and humans. And so wonderfully captures the ambiguity of fear and awe and uh you know hatred but also fascination and there's just this this wonderful complex relationship that develops between humans and dragons so i feel like there's a lot to talk about there do you want to talk about uh life ship trade or i guess it's really all the realm of the elderlings right um, yeah you... because and and again if you like they the i'm trying to think of how to do this without spoilers for the without spoilers yeah um but there are different evocations of things called dragons or modeled on dragons. And yeah. then you, you find out a lot more about what a dragon is and um, the relationship between dragons and humans. And it becomes, yeah. again, a complex ecosystem. It's not just, oh, look, there's a mountain and smog is in it. What does smog eat? Well, everyone, every couple of years, he wakes up and eats a couple of sheep. You go, hey, that's it pretty stark diet he's on <laughs> but with with hob there's much more of a sense of an ecosystem that they yeah. are actually integrated into the world they're not a symbol or a, a metaphor made manifest they, they yeah. are part of the fauna of the world and they are just as uh, again part of tying into different aspects of of species and and fantasy races and exploring it in that way. And that is, it's always exciting 
to see someone play with what is a such an established uh, and some would say cliched aspect of fantasy but do it in a way that you you genuinely go huh this is yeah. new i like this yeah without getting to spoilers like you said i mean the, the way she portrays the life cycle of of, of dragons is just brilliant um and she based it on something very specific i don't want to say what because that probably would be a spoiler but she's talked about that as well something in our own natural world that she's based and if you're if you've read the realm of the elder rings you probably know what i'm talking about but i don't want to spoil it for anybody but it, it's fascinating just how they are such an integral part of the ecosystem of that world and that's a brilliant aspect of that and but one of the things i think that rob did that was absolutely fascinating that that hub did it was um they the mythology that has built up around dragons yeah. is so distinct to the actual history and yeah. what dragons actually are and she plays with that aspect of this is how myths get made this is the misunderstanding of things this is over time people unless you write all of the stuff down and who's going to write it down and then this thing happens and then we lose that knowledge and then because life cycles are different yeah. um everything is just it's so fascinating how all of this gets done and i i think she has one of the the best um most complex forms of dragons oh yeah oh in, yeah in fantasy Absolutely. Uh, now, Le Guin's is not as complex, but I love what she does in, in the Earthsea books, in my opinion, is something more on the level of myth. Um, and I, I, I love the relationship between humans and dragons. Again, not getting into spoilers here, but it's something that you get hints of only in, in The Wizard of Earthsea, and it's something she develops. It's not until you get to maybe Tahanu that you really understand the depth of the relationship between humans and dragons. Um, so, um, but that's really fascinating because Le Guin does a lot of things with this sort of mirroring. She has a lot of yin yang aspects to her, her books. Um, uh, famously Taoism, it was something that she was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that humans and dragons are in some ways reflections of each other, uh, I think is a fascinating one and, and how dragons are, they are, you know, we created them for a reason. They they must fulfill some psychological function for for human minds and storytelling. And and she really does a great job, I think, of reflecting that in her books. Yeah, and um, one of the obviously dragons as ancient and wise and these teachers, which I you know I think comes very much from that Eastern tradition. Uh, we, I think we see yeah. that a lot more in um, the Eastern aspects of the of the dragon mm -hmm. yeah but yeah. Le Guin incorporates that and uh you see that again gets picked up by other authors like Raymond E. Feist in Magician has mm -hmm. a dragon in the first book and it's this dragon that remembers the pipe but it's old and lying there and and it's the end of of its life um we I, I, Darkness at Sethanon, a uh, dragon's very important to that. And the, the dragon, the Valharu, the um, the dragon lords are very important to, to Feist's uh, story. Yeah, yeah. So they, they play such an integral role in how we conceive of fantasy. And again, I think it's a, it's a combination because depending on how an author deploys them, they can be, they are massively physically powerful. And that in and of itself presents a challenge for a hero or an incredibly valuable ally. Yeah. But then combining it with, say, an aspect of magic or that they are incredibly long lived, because if you have them being sentient and long lived, then think of how much they would know. So these repositories of knowledge and you can see how the different thought processes build on each other to construct a new form of the dragon. If it's they're just big beasts, um, you go, well, you go in that one direction. Um, if you make them sentient, you go, well, am I going to limit their life cycle? Because in order to get to that size, how long must they live or how quickly must they grow? How much food would they have? Just as a rough calculation in your head. Or you go, yeah. well, it's going to take a long time. So they have an extended life cycle. And if they're sentient, what does that mean about learning? How do they interact with their environment? 
We still have moments yeah. where we look out and go, I remember when this was all fields. Now imagine how a dragon feels. I remember yeah. when this was all one continent and then it separated and drifted apart with continental drift. Yeah. Yeah, is it, is speaking of ancient beings with long memories that are, are they have a, a, an intelligence that is different from our own. Look at what Steven Erickson does in the Malazan books and, uh, you know, with the Elaine um, and, and their, without getting into spoilers once again, but uh, they go way, way back and, and they have a different uh, they have intelligence, obviously, uh, but there also are elements in that world where you, this isn't really a spoiler, I think, but there are soul taken as well. Um, beings who can take a humanoid form, but also a dragon form, so, which is pretty cool, right? <laughs> well, if you're going to, if you're going to change into something, you know, werewolf, oh, I can change into a wolf. Awesome. I can yeah. change into a dragon. Checkmate. Um, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. You know, if you're going to change into something like the idea of changing into a dragon, like this uber powerful form. But it, one of the, the fascinating things that I think Ericsson does to dismantle, like, because everyone will go, oh, well, I want to ship change into a dragon then. That's the best one. I want to ship, uh, always be a ship changer into a dragon. You, yeah. Okay. But what about changing into a giant swarm of, and that's where he, they, uh, both Esselmont and Ericsson bring in the, the, the yeah. divers, the yeah. diverse into many. And, yeah. You know, a dragon could be defeated in battle, but how do you defeat a swarm of locusts? How do you defeat a swarm of bees? Yeah. Um, that that suddenly is, you can see different ways of playing with it. And that was just thinking about the ship changing because we have ship changing throughout fantasy as well. And quite often it's the magical disguise of the dragon uh, pretending to be something else. Yeah. But in the Malazan world, too, it's, it's interesting how there is a connection between dragons and magic. And I'm not going to get into detail there, but that is something that Le Guin does. That is something, and through in Le Guin's case, through that ancient language thing that we were talking about before. Um, but but the, there it seems to often be a connection. And I think this is an ex, dragons as an expression of what we're after when we're reading fantasy, because there's often such a connection between dragons and magic. Um, and the two seem to go together sometimes, and sometimes they are actually linked in the stories in, in ways that are, you know, they're, they're part of each other. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating to me. In, in the Malazan books, the dragons have their own warren, for example. Um, so Starvald Demeling, right, um, is, the, uh, is the dragon warren. So, uh, and a lot of other magical things that happen in that world are related to dragons and that warren without giving away too much. Um, the whole idea of magic is in some ways, though, dependent on the existence of, of those dragons. So uh, very cool stuff, right? Yeah. And the, the number of, of different types that we see now about it, dragons of all shapes and sizes, dragons with all different powers and abilities and, and things like that. And you think in our world, have you ever seen a little tiny bearded dragon? Yeah, the, the yeah. Actual, I think they're really cute. That's one pet I would consider having, but <laughs> um, but dragons. It, it, but they can also be used as uh, like cute and cuddly thing. If you think of the the kids' <laughs> film, How to Train Your Dragon. Sure. Uh, yeah. That so much of that is about the the sort of the lost friend and uh, yeah. Or well, an older one would be Puff the Magic Dragon, right? Same thing, really. Yeah. I still, I think if I rewatch that now, I'd probably cry again. Oh, oh no! <laughs> yeah, little Jackie Draper and all that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. so dragons, dragons are amazing uh, because they can represent at once the the absolute worst aspects of what we fear about ourselves and made physically exactly. manifest. Yeah. But on the other hand, they can be something to strive towards, to be more powerful, to be more wise, to be part of this wonder of the fantasy world and the fact that the, there is this range on them now there's no way to say this is what a dragon is right that doesn't exist anymore even if it ever existed because i think dragons are closer to um a, a psychological archetype of yeah. Yeah. manifesting something and giving it shape in that and whether or not an author is challenging the idea of a monstrous form hiding a um, monstrous identity, 
or if it's a monstrous form, but the outside is not reflective of the inner spirituality about yeah. judging a book by its cover. But there's two things, very simple, very straightforward, and you can see how exactly the same thing can be done in radically different ways. Yeah. And to say then, oh, well, that's a real dragon and that's not a dragon. But it depends on the author. And yeah, just because in heraldry, one thing is referred to as a wyvern and another thing is referred to as a dragon, you go, big deal. That's heraldry. Yeah. Heraldry yeah. is not the fantasy novel that is sitting in front of me. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of judging a book by its cover, uh, if you just look at the to, to, the hold that dragons have on our imaginations as as fantasy readers is still absolutely strong, and and they're just they're wondrous creatures. They're uh, in many ways at the heart of the genre. You look at a, a book like John Gwynne's The Shadow of the Gods, and it, that cover. I'm not going to say what it, the role of the dragon is in the story because it would be kind of a spoilery, but that cover alone with this vast creature, and there is a tiny human figure you know, in uh, that sort of, I think it has a weapon out or something and it's looking up at this thing. That says it all, just that image, I think about, you were you were saying that, that sense of fear, but also awe and wonder. And it goes right back to, I think what we were talking about in the beginning about life force, about the dragons being an embodiment of both life and death. And that is something that it's carried through by many of these authors, I think really beautifully. Well, I, I think we've done dragons at least a bit of a service. I, okay. I don't think we could ever encompass everything <laughs> that the dragons represent. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for joining me, Philip. I've, I've enjoyed oh, this I, immensely. I did too. And I, I hope to hear from our viewers uh, as well, what their favorite dragons are uh, <laughs> in, in all of lore and fantasy lore and myth and all of that. I'm sure there'll be some great examples that we didn't think of as usual. Well. We could like I could go through now on my bookshelves and start listing off all of the different books that have dragons. Oh my goodness! But you just yeah. go, that'd be a really tedious video. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, thank you, AP. This was a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you, Philip, for joining me. For you, those of you still watching, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your continued support, and we will see you in the next one.